Turn with me this morning in your Bible to Philippians chapter 4. As you're turning to the place, I am conscious, of course, that today is traditionally known as Mother's Day or Mothering Sunday. And usually in the past, our custom has been to bring a message uh, that's fitting for that theme. So in a sense, today I'm going to break with tradition, but I trust that what I will say uh, will be helpful not only to all the mothers, but all the ladies, the young girls, and the young men, and us men included. Let's hear the word of the Lord. We're reading from Philippians chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 10. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me have flourished again, for in you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done, that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, Ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God should supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you. Chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And amen. We trust and pray the Lord will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now my text this morning is taken from Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through to 12. And my theme today is discovering the secret of true contentment. And isn't that a tremendous theme when you think about Mothering Sunday, the secret of true contentment? What it is and how to attain it. Now, my text is found in the opening part of Paul's final section of this letter to the church at Philippi. Remember, this is a church that under God he helped found many, many years earlier. There's many in that church that Paul personally led to the Lord. And this final part of the letter runs from verse 10 right through to verse 19 in chapter 4. And this section contains wonderful and important details regarding Paul and his relationship with the church at Philippi. Now, as you read this whole section from verse 10 through to 19, you could ask yourself, well, what are these verses teaching us? Because, you see, in a casual reading, they appear disjointed. At one minute, we're talking about Paul, and then he mentions the Philippian church, and, and then he mentions Christ. 
and, 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 and the, the, the thought appears a little complex. Uh, you see, at first glance, we think that the only thing that this section's teaching us is about a gift for Paul and his response regarding that gift. But I want to assure you that it's much, much more deeper than that. A very careful reading will reveal that there's three great themes here. And they're all connected. And they're all different aspects of living out the gospel as they're connected and related to Christ. Now, now let me just touch on them. Firstly, you've got the Philippians' generosity. Look at verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me have flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Paul's thinking of the kindness of the Philippian church displayed toward him. I rejoice greatly that at the last your care of me have flourished again. Look at verse 14. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. He says in verse 15, Now ye Philippians know also that at the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Look at verse 16. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Paul says in 17, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. And then he tells us something about the things which were sent from you via the hand of Epaphroditus, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. And you see, Here's a reference to the Philippians' generosity. Multiple references to the gifts that were sent to Paul in prison to meet his need. And you could think of how the church sent Epaphroditus uh, with gifts to Paul to encourage him and help him. And we're not told the nature of these gifts. We're not told the exact items. It could have been monetary. It could have been something else, but I want to tell you their gifts were indicative of their love for him as a man of God. And they were also indicative of their willingness to help in the work of the gospel. You see, the Philippians were a giving church. They were a generous people. God had blessed them. God had helped them, and now they were giving back to God to help the man of God, and they were doing it with a heart of love. They were doing it with a, a good, kind heart. God had blessed the congregation, and he'd given them many gifts, and, and they were good stewards of that blessing because what God had bestowed upon them, they were using that willingly for the furtherance of the gospel. But isn't there an application for us? All that we have, everything in life, physically, materially, spiritually, have we received it as a gift of God? The gift of life, the gift of health and strength, the gift of food, the gift of clothing, the gift of family. And then add all the spiritual gifts of love and grace and kindness and mercy. Salvation. You see, if God blessed us with gifts, then let us be careful to think about all that we have as a gift from God and be careful to use that gift, whether it's our time, whether it's our talent or our tithe, to, to advance the kingdom of God. The Philippian church was a giving church, a missionary-minded church, a kind church. And there was no reluctance in their part to help the Lord's servant in his need. They, they, they were willing to do that, and they did it time and time again. And there was no reluctance in their part to help further the work of the gospel. And all this was an evidence, not only of their love to the Lord, but their growth in grace. So there's the Philippians' generosity. That's one of the themes that's in this final section. I want you to think also of Paul's gratitude here. You see, Paul is grateful for their loved gift and their care of him. And in this final section, he 
is it great pains to thank them for their gifts and their contribution toward him. Philippians 4 verses 10 to 19 has been described by one commentator as a kind of a a thank you note. When somebody does something nice to you and and, and, uh, blesses you with, 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 with something, then it's right and proper that you say thank you. And, and you might send a thank you note to someone uh, for blessing them in that way. And that's exactly what Paul's doing. He rejoices that they thought of him in prison, that, that they remembered him. He's thankful for their love, for their care, for their concern for him as a, as a faithful minister, as a faithful servant of the Lord. He is thankful for the sacrifice that they have made to minister unto him again and again. You know, it's never out of place to be thankful, to thank those who show kindness to us. Aren't many today unthankful? Isn't that one of the characteristics of the end time age? People that are full of ingratitude? Isn't this a big problem, unthankfulness? Sometimes, and I'm not taking a swipe at the teenagers here, but teenagers feel that they have a, a, a right to have their needs met. That, 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 that life owes them something. That their parents owe them something. But, but teenagers, remember the Bible says, be thankful unto him and bless his name. The Bible says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And it's right and proper, and could I say to the teenagers, give thanks for mummy today. You, you, you thank God in your heart. Thank your Lord for such a good mummy who does everything that she can for me as an individual. And she does it out of love and the goodness and the kindness of her heart. And if you're thankful, then you will respond in that kind, I believe. Remember, thankfulness is the will of God. And if you're unthankful, then you're not fulfilling the will of God. I want you to think thirdly, because there's another theme. Not only the Philippians' generosity and Paul's gratitude... But I want you to think of providential grace. And I'm keeping it alliterated, even though we heard a bit about alliteration when the retired ministers were here. Paul is thinking, as he sits in prison, of the generosity of the Philippian believers to him. And he's there giving thanks to the Lord for all their gifts to him. And, and as I've said, this is a kind of a thank you note to them. But, but remember, he is a man who sits in a prison cell. He's awaiting sentence of death. And while he is there, he is thankful and careful to convey his appreciation for their gifts. But he wants them to understand something. And it's this, that he's not dependent on their gifts to be content. He is content whatsoever he receives or whatever he doesn't receive. He is independent of what he has or what he doesn't have. He is in every situation content. Here he is in a difficult situation in a prison cell awaiting death. He, he, he talks in verse 14 about my affliction. And yet he combines in this thank you note, not only a word of thanks, but a valuable lesson on contentment. And I come back to what I said at the start, to discover the secret of true contentment. And here it is in this final section. Not only the Philippians' gratitude, and, and, and are the Philippians generosity and Paul's gratitude, but providential grace. We live in a discontented world, don't we? we? We live in an age when true contentment seems so elusive. Many pursue after contentment, but don't find it. Let me tell you a little story. Think of a river. And in that river, there's two little teardrops. And they're floating on the top of the river, 
And one said to the other, well, well, who are you? And the one teardrop said, I'm a teardrop from a girl who loved the man, but lost him to another girl. Who are you? And the other teardrop said, I'm a teardrop from the girl that got him. You see, we can pursue after contentment. And, and, and we can think, well, if I had this, that, and the other, I'll be content. But yet when we get it, we discover that true contentment is as elusive as ever. And you think of the high rate of consumer debt. Think of the high divorce rate. Think of the clamor for rights. Think of the accumulation of material things. Think of the, the drug culture, the drink culture, the party scene. And, and, and isn't it true that we live in such a discontented age? And, and it seems the more and more things that we have, the bigger spirit of discontentment that's in our heart. Why? Because we have never discovered the secret of true contentment. So in the next 15 minutes, if you bear with me, or 20, I want you to discover this morning, in this final section, which I've tried to open it up, the secret of true contentment. Now, notice, first of all, the foundation of true contentment. You see, the key, the real secret of true contentment is found being in Christ in our relationship with him. In this final section, Christ is mentioned. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Verse 19, he says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You see, when you see Christ as your Lord and Savior, as you, when you see Christ as the one who is sovereign, over your whole life and its affairs, when you see Christ as the one who, who supplies your every need, you discover something. You learn the secret in Christ, the key to a life of true inner contentment, to, to, a, to a life of peace, to, to a life of the rest of faith. You see, in Christ, there's a total and absolute dependence on him as my sovereign, my savior, my supplier, my, my satisfier. When I think of the word content in verse 11, Paul says, not that I speak in respect of one, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. What does that word content mean? I want to tell you it doesn't mean making the best out of a bad situation. It's not merely putting up with things. It's not resigning like a stoic to your particular set of circumstances. The Greek word is very strong here, the word content. It means to be independent of external circumstances or situation. In other words, you're not controlled by your circumstance. You're not mastered by your situation. Contentment, true contentment, isn't really connected to the possessions that you have. It's not merely connected to your possession or status in life. It's not even connected to having powerful friends in high places. The, the idea is to be living independent of your circumstances. You're living a self-sufficient, self-satisfied life. But that doesn't mean you're indifferent to your circumstances. It doesn't mean that you're detached from your situation, from being emotionally involved. Or, or, or abandoning reason. It doesn't mean that you don't try to improve your situation or your lot in life or you try to make progress and better oneself. It's nothing to do with being indifferent to your pain and your tears and your trials and your hardship. 
It doesn't mean that we don't need to make our needs known to God in prayer and seek his guidance and help and ask for his counsel. It doesn't even mean that we don't desire to see our circumstances and situation changed. But it does mean that we're not controlled or mastered by our circumstances. You see, can't we rejoice when all's going well? Things are good at home. No problems at school. No, nobody bullying us. Everything's okay at work. We, we, we don't have any money worries. We, we, we have a company of friends. Um, maybe your favorite football team is winning. Uh, maybe you're not even bothered that Leinster beat uh, Ulster yesterday by a few tries. You, you feel your life's good and all is well. And then all of a sudden your bubble bursts. And the day of trouble comes. And I want to tell you, all of us will have a day of trouble. The Bible says the Lord is good. You hear me repeating this often. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And uh, 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 know them that trust in him. And I remember hearing the late Willie Mullen preach about the day of trouble that comes to us all. Uh, and, and when the day of trouble comes and you have problems in the home. And you have problems at school and problems at work and your financial difficulties and, and, and children rebel against you even though you're their mother or their father but they rebel against you and say nasty things to you and, and your friends desert you and you feel you're being badly treated or badly neglected. In a time like this, we can be mastered by our circumstances. And in a time like that, we can feel discontent. But here's Paul. And because he's in Christ, he's discovered the secret of true contentment. See, Paul knew what it was to enjoy plenty. He knew what it was to be in poverty. Times when he was hungry and times when he was full. Times when he was abased and times when he was abound and suffered need. Turn over there in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look with me at verse 23. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-three. 23. He says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Here's Paul. And in all these trials and troubles that come into his life, he, he, he faces great challenges. And in these trials and troubles, he's in danger of losing his joy, his peace of God, his rest of faith in Christ. But here he's discovered in the jailhouse in Rome that he's content whenever he has plenty. He is content in his poverty. He's even content in the changing circumstances of life because change will come. Things will not stay the same forever. There's such a thing as the adjustment of life. And in the day of trouble, when the fear and the anxiety and the worry and, 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 and you're blown off course and you're left friendless, just remember that if you're in Christ and he's your savior, your sovereign, your supplier, your satisfier, you can discover that you can live independently of being affected by your external circumstances. You see, this is a very sweeping statement. If you look at verse 10, it says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me have flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be consent. Whatsoever state I am. 
He says in verse 12, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. A very sweeping statement. In whatsoever state I am, in all types of situations, at all times, in all the trials of life, I'm content. I'm not mastered by my circumstances or situation because I'm in Christ. He's my sovereign, my savior, my supplier, my satisfier. And you know, isn't it wonderful when you think about discovering the secret of true contentment? Who can tell us? Who can we go to and ask? Have you got the answer to true contentment? It's Paul the prisoner awaiting sentence of death in the prison cell at Rome. And even in that state, he's not in turmoil. He's not unsettled. He's not mumbling and complaining. He's not cursing God. He's not doubting him. He's not denying him. He's not adopting his mindset full of sinful schemes to alleviate the situation and how can I escape from prison? No, he's he's resting in Christ. He's rejoicing in Christ. That's the foundation of true contentment. I want you to think, secondly, the focus of true contentment. How did Paul come to this place where he was not controlled or mastered by his circumstances, where he was not dissatisfied with his lot in life? How did he reach this place where he could enjoy plenty and at other times be in absolute poverty? Abased and abound, he says in verse 12. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Here's, here's what I want you to focus on because here's part of the secret. Look at verse 11. He says, for I have learned. And we'd pause there. And then come to verse 12. He says, I am instructed. Do do you see that? I have learned. I have been instructed. And he he learned by precept through the revelation of God to him in Christ. And he learned by practice. And and the word learned and instructed are, are connected. One means to be taught by precept and the other means to to be taught by by practice you see this was not a natural thing for Paul I want you to understand that that Paul was a proud individual by nature and he he often sought his own way he was driven by passion and pride long before he was converted He, he marked out his own path he was doing his own thing but now he's saved now he's a servant of Jesus Christ and and now he, he has to endure all this trial and hardship. He, here he is, a prisoner, and, and it's hard to cope. He's cold. There's times he's hungry. He's got beatings. He's been taunted of the devil. What's the secret? Could, could I tell you this? Tradition has it that a businessman one time visited Paul in prison. He got Instructions from Timothy how he could apply to to have a a visit of Paul in in the prison. And whenever he came out of that meeting, Timothy asked him, how did it go? And he says, I'm confused. I can't understand how that man, cold and hungry, in that cell, can be so happy and so joyful. And he's smiling. And he's reading, and, and there's a strength about him, an inner beauty. And I can't put my finger on it. You know what Paul or Timothy told him? He says he's in love. You ever see somebody in love? They have a big smile on their face. They have the care in the world. And all they're thinking about is their partner. Him or her. And they're just taken up with that. Well, that was Paul. Paul was in love with Jesus Christ. And he learned by the precepts of the word of God to be content in Christ. And he learned by practice to submit himself to Christ. He was resting in him as his sovereign. He saw Christ as being absolute control. 
He submitted himself to his will, whatever the Lord wills for me. He, he was resting in him as a saviour. He was resting in him as the one who was sufficient to meet his need. He was resting in him as the one who was a satisfier of his soul. And that was his focus. He was in love with Christ. So therefore he learned from Christ. He was instructed by Christ. Are you saved this morning? Are you a servant of Christ? Are you learning from Christ? Is he, do you see him as your sovereign? Is he your saviour? Is he sufficient to meet your need? Is he your satisfier? Because that's what Paul focused on. I want you to think also this morning of the features of true contentment. You see, Paul, when we think about the things that he learned, let me just give you a little list as we finish. He learned to rest in the promises of God. Remember he had the thorn in the flesh, the problem with the eyes, and he prayed about it three times and he asked the Lord to take it away. And what did the Lord say? The Lord said no. Isn't that strange? And yet the Lord told him in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and 9, my grace is sufficient for thee. Paul had a promise of endless grace, sufficient grace, perfectly tailored to meet his need. It's not a tremendous promise. And that promise is yours and mine in Christ for all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen. And there's about 7,300 promises in the book. And what God promises, God will perform. And this is one of the features of true contentment. It's resting in the promises of God. Can you do that this morning? What about resting in the providence of God? Remember he says in Romans chapter 8 and in the uh, verse 28, he says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. All things? Paul's imprisonment? Was that in the will of God? Paul's hunger pains? The coldness that he felt? The answer is yes. It was Matthew Henry that said, if God looks after the birds, how much more shall he not look after his babes? Do you know the very hairs of your head are numbered? And here's Paul that he rested in the providence of God, that God is in control of all things. Every detail of my life, he has it under his control. Is not an encouragement? Did you know that George Mueller in Bristol in February the 8th, 1842, was looking after, was it two or three orphan houses and he needed coal to light the boiler. He needed porridge and he needed milk for the porridge. And he wrote in his diary, if these needs are not met by the morning, Lord, your name will be dishonored in Bristol. And you know, we get up in the morning he went to the orphan house, the main house, and he discovered that coal had arrived. The, the coal cart came down past the door and a few bags fell off. Something spooked the horse and jumped up and a few bags fell off. That was God. God was behind that. And, and not only that there, but the baker, he, he, he burnt the bread. He, there was something happened and he left too many loaves in the oven too long and you ladies know what that's like. And, 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 and he brought the bread knocked on George Mueller's door and said to the, the lady, um, uh, I've got some bread here, it's a wee bit burnt, but it would be all right. And, and she brought in the loaves. And you know what? There was a businessman going past the door. And he thought about the orphanages and he, he prayed a wee prayer. God bless George Mueller and bless the orphans that are in there. They're hungry wee children, Lord. And as he walked on past, he had this thought in his head, put your hand in your pocket and go and buy two bags of meal uh, and corn and oats for, for the children. But he walked on and he walked on and he, could, he, he got to the point where he'd walked about 10 or 15 minutes past the door and he couldn't go any further and he had to come back. He knocked on the door and he handed over the money and said, that's to buy oats and corn or whatever you need for the children. See, God was at work. God had put it in his heart. You see, the providence of God. What about the presence of God? How many people was with Paul? He said, no man stood with me. Nevertheless, the Lord stood with me. You see, Paul was content 
that God would not forsake him. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Remember he already writ, wrote in this uh, passage here in Philippians 4. Uh, the Lord is at hand, verse 5. In other words, the Lord was at his elbow every moment of every day, 24-7. And the Lord said, I'll not forget you, Paul. You're graven in the palms of my hand. You're in my thoughts. You're on my heart. I bear your burdens on my shoulder. I'll not fail you. And whatever your need is, the greatest need of all is you have my presence. It's not what the psalmist said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And Dr. Douglas, who was here on Friday night, used to teach us that the center Hebrew word in Psalm 23 was with me, with me. What about resting in the power of the Lord? Didn't Paul say that he was made perfect in his weakness? He was weary. He was discouraged. He had many circumstances and situations that troubled him. But, but, but he, could, he could rest in that in his weakness he could be made strong. And in his discouragement he could have peace of soul. Why? Because in Hebrews 13 and 8 we read Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and forever. I am the Lord, I change not. Malachi said. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob, you're not consumed. Why? Because he's great in power. We could talk this morning about the pardon that he rested in, the knowledge of sins forgiven, a full and free and forever. But do you have that knowledge of sins forgiven, a full and free pardon? All your sins, past, present, and future, blotted out under the blood. And he rested in the peace of God. Could I just read this final verse before we close? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If Christ died for us and took our sins and sorrows, and we think of the center tree that God spared him not, but gave him up unto death and the shedding of his precious blood, because that would have mean the horrible death of crucifixion. And why did he do it? If he gave us Christ the best that he had, shall he not also freely give us all things that we need? Isn't it true, the Lord is my shepherd? I shall not want. And here's the features of Paul's contentment. He was resting in God's promises, God's providence. He, 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 he was resting in God's presence, in God's power, in God's pardon, and in God's peace because it was connected to Christ. See, that brings me back. The secret of true contentment is being in Christ. I trust that you'll discover this secret this morning. And if you haven't, that you'll come to Christ and you'll see him as sovereign, savior, supplier. And if you get your mind in that, what a blessing that will be to your heart.